When you were a kid, did you ever have a friend who had a really cool toy? I mean, like the most amazing, awesome toy in existence, and for some reason he had the only copy available in the world? So for months and months, all you wanted was to get your hands on that toy and claim it as your own. Then one day out of nowhere, your friend just gets bored with it, gives it right to you. So there, after all this time you spent coveting this amazing, awesome toy, it's finally yours. And then you destroy it, just tear it apart, you smash it to pieces with a rock, you throw it in your dad's barbecue grill, you shove it in a pile of dog crap, you put it under a magnifying glass on a hot summer's day. That's kind of like what happened to Bret Hart and WCW. Of all the examples of WCW dropping the ball, perhaps none are as infamous as the company's mistreatment of Bret Hart. Considered by many to be one of the biggest wasted opportunities in the Monday Night War, the hitman spent the bulk of his time there completely underutilized. By the time he finally reached his potential as a main event star, his career was cut short due to an errant kick to the dome. So strap on your wraparound shades and scream down a long dark hallway. Bret! Because we're about to take a closer look at what could have been with Bret Hart. Our story begins not in Atlanta, but in Stamford, Connecticut. By 1997, our Canadian hero had worked for the WWF for 12 years, becoming a multiple-time tag team, intercontinental, and world champion. In fact, he became the second person in WWF history after Hulk Hogan to hold their top belt five times. This is back when that was actually an accomplishment. In 1996, Hart signed an unprecedented 20-year contract with the WWF, but Vincent Mann later confessed to Brett that the company could not afford the contract. In 1997, Brett reluctantly looked at greener pastures and signed a three-year, multi-million dollar deal with WCW. Now, a lot of you know what's coming up next in this story, the old Montreal screw job. Now, I'm not interested in drudging up an old story that's been beaten to death for the last 19 years. So I'm outsourcing this part of the review to someone who's way more into it at this point than I am. So please welcome, for your primer on the Montreal screw job, 13-year-old me. Take it away, Brian. Thanks, older me. The Montreal screw job took place during the main event of Survivor Series 1997, when Bret Hart defended the championship against Shawn Michaels. Even though he was leaving for WCW after this match, no matter what, Brett still didn't want to drop the title to HBK, mostly because Michaels was an unprofessional prick. Hart was under the impression the match would end in a no contest, also known as a schmoz. Then Brett would give the belt up the next night on Monday Night Raw. But in the ultimate act of betrayal, Vincent Mann told the referee to ring the bell the second Shawn Michaels locked in the sharpshooter. Learn more about it in the biopic, The Jesse Ventura Story. Back to you, present day Brian. Thanks, me. So after Montreal, WCW was given the ultimate free kick. Here you have Bret Hart, one of the best wrestlers alive, coming to your show hot off the heels of one of the biggest stories in wrestling history. Now, WCW was already beating the WWF in the ratings war at that time. So if used correctly, having Bret Hart on your side could have easily put the McMahons away for good. But let's just say there's a reason there's no WCW network today. Due to a 60-day no-compete clause, Brett was not able to wrestle for WCW right away, but he was an integral part of Starcade 97. He was the guest referee for a match between Eric Bischoff and Larry Zbysko, where control of Monday Nitro was on the line. But Hart played an equally pivotal role in the main event of Sting vs. Hollywood Hogan for the WCW Championship. Now, this is arguably the biggest and most hyped up main event in company history. Sting did not wrestle for more than a year in the build up to this match. For months and months, he would stand up in the rafters with that crow makeup on, watching all these heinous acts the NWO were committing on WCW. So he was going to swoop in at Starcade and knock Hogan off the perch and bring the championship home for the good guys, right? Well, let's see. In what I can only assume was some flagrant abuse of his creative control clause, Hogan beat the bejesus out of Sting, barely taking any offense from him for the bulk of the match. Then came time for the finish. Crooked referee Nick Patrick did a fast count on Sting after the leg drop, but Bret Hart prevented the bell from being rung. Vowing not to let another screw job like the one in Montreal happen again, he knocked out the ref and helped turn the tie for the Stinger, who beat Hogan and brought the championship home. The plan was supposed to involve a fast count, but... One! Seems like kind of a regular count, doesn't it? In fact, I bet it actually went slower than most regular counts. So instead of looking like a hero fighting for justice, Bret Hart came off more like a prickish bully, robbing Hogan of what was basically a clean victory and helping the loser Sting win the title. Hey Bret, who's doing the screwing now? Oh my god, that should have been his new catchphrase. Bret's first WCW match took place at Sold Out in January of 1998 when he defeated Ric Flair. Hart spent the next few months fighting for the honor of WCW by taking on members of the New World Order. So it made perfect sense when he came out on an episode of Nitro that April to do this. 
Yep, just four months after costing Hogan the WCW title at Starcade, Bret then helped him win it back against Randy Savage. And just out of curiosity, on what day did this particular Nitro take place? On what day did Eric Bischoff and Kevin Sullivan make this booking decision? 420, you say? Huh, most interesting. For the next several months, Bret Hart was an associate of the NWO, though never officially a member. And here's where the true injustice of Bret Hart's time in the company took place. WCW was given this golden opportunity to do something meaningful with Hart after being the top guy in their rival company who left under controversial circumstances. Bret could have easily done well doing his own thing as a babyface, which he's always been much better at doing than being a heel. But instead, he became another cog in the growing NWO machine, a lackey for Hulk Hogan. The same guy who did the most damage to Bret's WWF career right when he was being established as the company's next top guy. Brett's time as an NWO ally reached peak stupidity during an episode of Nitro in September of that year, when he asked fans for forgiveness and took on Hollywood in a match later that night. As Hogan was working the leg, Sting showed up to help out the hitman. He was carried away on a stretcher, but came back to the ring to beat up Sting and reveal he and Hogan were still friends. No, 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 Vince Russo was not booking for the company yet. That twist wouldn't have been so terrible if Hulk Hogan and Scott Hall didn't do the exact same thing two months earlier. But Bret's time in WCW wasn't all madness and idiocy, as he became a decorated champion during his run there. He became a four-time United States champion, a record for that title in the company, adding much prestige to the belt. In February of 1999, Hart lost the belt to Roddy Piper in a match on Nitro, after interference from Will Sasso. Wait, Will Sasso? That can't be right. Let me look at that thing. Will, Will Sasso? Will, Will Sasso? What? No. You know... No, I, d mm, mm, I don't believe it. No, you know what, young me, can I tag you in for a few minutes? Just take care of this for a second. I gotta walk this off. I did, no, I can't believe this. No, 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 no. Okay, cool, I'm back. Actor and comedian Will Sasso got involved in this match after Bret Hart attacked him during an episode of Mad TV, the sketch comedy show on Fox. The sketch involved Hart playing the new lieutenant governor for Jesse Ventura, played by Sasso. In a move that was reminiscent of the infamous Andy Kaufman incident on the show Fridays, the actors began to break character when Hart was getting too aggressive. It ended with Hart laying out Sasso with a chair and putting him in the sharpshooter right in front of the audience. After the US title match, Brett came back to Mad TV and confronted Will Sasso in an arm wrestling contest, which he also lost. Great! The rivalry concluded on the February 15th edition of Nitro, in which Hart and Sasso actually competed in the ring. And because this was WCW, Sasso's castmate Deborah Wilson turned heel and interfered, costing Sasso the match. Compelling stuff, folks. Back to me, you. Or is it back to you, me? Thanks, kid. Now time for one of the few genuine highlights in Brett's WCW tenure, after he called out Bill Goldberg on an episode of Nitro. Count. Oh. Oh. Shit, yeah, so cool. WCW, I quit. Okay, that kind of takes the edge off it, but still cool. In reality, Brett took a few months off to heal from injuries, but what a way to go out. Taking down the indestructible Goldberg with some cleverly hidden weaponry? Why wasn't he doing stuff like this all the time in WCW? Why not hide spikes in his leather jacket, or have mace spray out the front of his sunglasses, or better yet, just shoot people like your action figure would? Just before he was set to return from his time off, Owen Hart fell to his death during the Over the Edge pay-per-view in May. After taking an additional four months off to be with family, the hitman returned to WCW to a massive welcome from the fans. In October, he and Chris Benoit worked an absolute clinic in what has since been called the Owen Hart Tribute Match. A month later, the two fought again in the finals of the WCW Championship Tournament at the first ever Mayhem pay-per-view, which saw Brett finally realize the potential he had from the day he set foot in WCW and win the vacant championship. And just when you thought Brett was finally gonna get over the hump. Wow, Johnny, Johnny, go to That's the infamous thrust kick by Goldberg that concussed Bret Hart during the main event of Starcade 1999. And if that wasn't bad enough, they decided to dig up the old Montreal screw job again in the absolute laziest way possible. Sharp shooter! Put the sharp shooter on! Put the sharp shooter! What the? The next night on Nitro, Bret vacated the championship out of respect for Goldberg, and the two fought for it in the main event. Then immediately turned heel by forming the NWO 2000 with Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and Jeff Jarrett. 
Let's list all the problems with this right now. First of all, a title was needlessly vacated for Brett to win it back the same night. Oh yeah, he also turned face and heel one night as well. Two, boo, no more NWO, kill the damn thing already. And third, NWO 2000? Why don't you ask Eric Watts and Chad Fortune what the year 2000 at the end of their tag team name, how that worked out for them. But the good times for Brett and the new, new, new world order didn't last, as Brett's concussion problems finally caught up to him. Maybe it's because he never took time off after Starcade. Maybe it's because he fought Terry Funk in a friggin' hardcore match. I guess we'll never know what the tipping point was. Brett relinquished the title in January of 2000 and never wrestled again, though he would appear sporadically in WCW, including this moment with Bill Goldberg in the desert. Hey, 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 no. yeah. oh, hey, not right Goldberg out. Eh, it's not as cool as a hidden steel plate. In October of that year, Brett was given the old fired via FedEx treatment, and that was the official end of his time in WCW. So, was it one of the biggest missed opportunities in wrestling? Yes, definitely. But did Bret Hart really have that terrible of a run in WCW? Eh, you know, in my opinion, not really. I mean, sure, he deserved to be in the world title picture a lot sooner than he ended up being, and his feud with Will Sasso was completely stupid, but from the moment he showed up on WCW television, he was always doing something. He was always placed in major storylines, and he won championships. WCW screwed up by not taking advantage of his popularity after Montreal, but considering how toxic and political the locker room was at the time, I guess it's amazing he got anywhere at all. But the blame for his WCW woes can't be all placed on the company itself. Simply put, Brett was the victim of a lot of circumstances beyond his control that severely affected his career. Eric Bischoff has said in the past that the Montreal screw job, combined with the death of his brother Owen, turned Brett into an emotional shell of his former self, often showing up 30 minutes before showtime and not being very interested in what he was booked for. In my opinion, the two biggest problems with Brett's run in WCW are that he was put in the main event too late and that he suffered a career-ending injury. In the end, you can't help but wonder what might have been if one or both of those things went differently. Hey, hey, man, uh, just checking in. Do you need anything else from me? Oh, hey, uh, no, man, you're good for now. Honestly, all this talk about Brett and WCW has got me kind of depressed. Boy, you sure get depressed a lot on this show. I am not looking forward to growing to be you, man. Oh really? You think this is bad off? Why don't you talk to me when you're a senior in high school, look at your life situation then, and then we'll talk, okay? Well that's it for this week, fans. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, comment below, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. Uh, are you talking to me? Or them? I, I don't really know anymore. Get out of here! But if I stay... You only see right through me And then that look of shame inside my eyes